Okay, I, I think we're ready to get started, ladies and gentlemen. The Nancy Bernkoff Tucker Memorial Lecture is one of the most important things that we do here at the Wilson Center. Um, the, uh, I, I've always believed, even before I got here, um, that the Asia Program Director at Wilson is, is an important institution in Washington, an important consistent voice that's um, been driving research on Asia for several decades now. Um, and honoring Nancy and her legacy is a very important part uh, of what we do here. And uh, the, the lectures that we've had um, for, the, for the two years that I've been here have been, all been very interesting, very important, and I think a, a very fitting tribute to Nancy. Um, and this uh, year promises to be no exception. We're very pleased and honored to welcome Jerome Cohen uh, to give this year's lecture. Um, for those of you who don't know him, I think everybody here does know him. I think um, <clears throat> I, I, if we're going to give any introductions here, it should be me rather than Jerry, rather than uh, in terms of who people know. Um, but we're just very pleased to be here. For those of you who don't know Jerry, he's a NYU law professor specializing in East Asian affairs, faculty director of U.S. Asia Law Institute. Uh, he's also adjunct senior fellow for Asia at the Council on Foreign Relations, previously taught at Berkeley and uh, at Harvard Law School, authored innum uh, innumerable books and articles on various subjects related to China and the law, um, and has been a driver of U.S.-China relations in very important and significant ways for several decades now. Um, and today, he's going to be giving a lecture on uh, Jack Downey, a classmate of his, um, who he had a, who Jerry had a very important role in, in um, getting him released in the 1970s. Uh, so I'm very uh, interested for both the specifics of the story, but also its implications for international law today. So with that, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Abe. I hope my obituary is as kind. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm grateful to Warren and to the Wilson Center for the opportunity to be here and the stimulus it has given me to renew my acquaintance with Nancy's work. Uh, my assistant at NYU was amazed at the number of books I uh, had to get from the library that all were products of Nancy's scholarship. And of course, it's good to pay tribute to what she told us about the post-World War II relations between the U.S. and China. And the thing that struck me, as must strike many of you, is how pertinent, how important this background and her insights are today, and unfortunately, probably tomorrow. So it's a good occasion, and of course, I took the occasion to renew my acquaintance with Warren's own work. So this is a good time to think about U.S.-China relations. Every day we're bombarded with the whole range of views, and uh, we have people who think we've got to go all out to uh, stop what's going on in China, even if it may take the use of force. We have other people who see we're on the road to tragedy, and I have to look back on my own efforts of many years and wonder, am I getting too close to the China bashers? Or am I just following what Keynes said? If the facts change, you have to also adjust your own views. But I think the topic today uh, inevitably involves China and its views of international law and, more important, its practice of international law. I put out with uh, Professor Cho Hong Da, who's no longer with us in 1974, a massive two-volume documentary study that was an overview for the first time of what the People's Republic was doing in the international law field. Uh, I'm just coming out this week with a shorter overview of more recent practice and in a companion piece about law and power in 
China's domestic relations. And there are some important links there, even though contrasts in theory uh, that are interesting we could talk about later. But let's turn to uh, the topic. Uh, you know, international law is interactive. Uh, you can't expect other countries to behave themselves according to your perception of the rules if your own government fails to do the same. So each country's conduct has an inevitable impact on the others. International law is also based on reciprocity. Uh, not almost 50 years ago, I'd say, an astute French observer named Philippe Ardan said, China, PRC China, the People's Republic, Communist China, what we used to call Red China, that China had a distinctive view of reciprocity. He said, their view is, I demand freedom from you in the name of your principles, and I deny it to you in the name of mine. <laughs> and of course, it's an amusing, often true uh, observation, but we also have to understand that uh, it could be applicable to the United States and others. I think perhaps the most profound thing I have ever heard is the words of the Scottish poet Robert Burns, oh, would the Lord this gifty gee us to see ourselves as others see us. And maybe that could be the theme of uh, today's uh, talk. Well, I pick this story because this is Washington. I know what Nancy's work covered, what era. I know the importance of the Wilson Center and the contemporary concerns that we all have about U.S.-China relations. As Abe said, I also have picked this for, for personal reasons because Jack Downey was my classmate. We were acquaintances, not close friends, but acquaintances. He was a very likable and uh, modest uh, person. But I picked it not just for personal reasons, but having been his classmate, I had an unusual opportunity to see the reality of how this story started. And I'll make that clear in a minute. And I do think, finally, uh, it's important to consider this story for what it tells us about international law and China's perception, communist China's perception of how the U.S. preaches and practices uh, international law. So there are lots of reasons, and I hope what I say will vindicate uh, the origins uh, of this talk. How did the story begin? <clears throat> it was February 1951. Uh, Jack and I were in the class of 51, preparing to graduate in June. There were 1,050 of us, I believe, and almost all of us, all men, were anxious about what was going to happen to us on graduation. Uh, in February 48, in our freshman year, we'd had the Czech crisis with the Soviet Union taking over uh, Czechoslovakia. It had a huge impact. It was certain then the Cold War was on us, and some of our classmates began to scatter. Uh, even then, my roommate left, took a special one-year program in the Navy that guaranteed he could come back and finish college. We all wanted to finish college. I was attracted to a... Uh, Marine Corps program that promised you could stay at Yale the next three years if you signed up for ROTC and went to Quantico for summer training. And on graduation, they said they would make me a second lieutenant platoon leader. I thought that sounded like a good deal. But I went to my father, who had enlisted in World War I, 
and he wouldn't sign. I was only 17. I needed his permission. It's the only time I ever was angry with my father. I thought, this is a good deal, and he's frustrating it. But three years later, February 51, I began to consider the wisdom of what Mark Twain had said. When he was 18, he thought his parents were ignorant and was amazed how much they had learned by the time he was 21. <laughs> Some of my friends, acquaintances, in the previous class of 1950 who had taken that platoon leader opportunity went to Korea right after graduation. Some were killed. I then discovered a platoon leader is up front. And uh, my dear friend and former law clerk colleague, John Nolan, uh, wrote a book about his experiences in Korea as a platoon leader. So by February 51, as I looked every day at the bulletin board that advertised job prospects for graduating seniors, I saw something in addition to the usual IBM, General Motors, Procter & Gamble, this was a sign said, Mr. So-and-so from the CIA will be here next week to interview graduating seniors. I thought, this is better than being a platoon leader. Maybe I can be an analyst in Washington, and I could uh, use my international relations major to good effect. Well, I went to one of the meetings that he held, at this one, there were about 30 of us in my class. I don't think Jack Downey was there. There were many ways the agency was using to recruit people in my class, some through professors on the faculty, some through other arrangements. But there were 30 of us there, and of course, I wanted to know what kind of work uh, they might want to offer us. But the uh, gentleman involved, I want to call him John Jones, but I don't know that that was his name. Uh, he was hopelessly vague. And finally, with some uh, impatience, I said in front of the group, now look, can't you at least give us a hypothetical? How can we be interested? And he looked at me with some evident annoyance, and he said, okay, I'll give you a hypothetical, but mark you, it's purely hypothetical. He said, we might want to train you and then drop you into Red China to organize resistance against the new government. Well, my jaw must have dropped. <laughs> and I said in front of the group, gosh, that sounds awfully dangerous. <laughs> and he, he became irate. Uh, he said, during the last war, we, meaning the OSS, predecessor organization, we had fewer casualties than the infantry. And I said, are you talking on a relative or absolute basis? <laughs> and he said to me, I don't think you're seriously interested. <laughs> and I said in front of the group, you're right. <laughs> and I walked out. Later, through the grapevine, I learned that of the 30 of us there, 12 had said, they were interested, but six had been uh, rejected as insufficiently rugged. Jack Downey was not insufficiently rugged. He was captain of the wrestling team. He was varsity football tackle, 195 pounds. He made it. Well, we finished uh, college June 13th, 1951. Graduation, Jack was there as far as I know. I'm not certain. Maybe he'd already gone to Washington, but he went immediately afterward. And uh, less than 18 months later, he was shot down over China uh, in a plane organized by the agency to pick up anti-communist Chinese who'd been previously dropped in Northeast China. Uh, they had been captured unbeknownst to the agency people in Japan, and an ambush was arranged. And on a beautiful moonlit night, November 29th of uh, 1952, uh, tragedy came. The pilots were killed in the crash, 
But Jack and his sidekick, Richard Fecteau, who joined the agency a year later, but was slightly older than Jack and who's still alive now at 91, uh, they were captured along with a number, maybe 14 or so, of these anti-communist Chinese, some of whom had worked for the Chiang Kai-shek forces before. Uh, some of them were sentenced to death. Uh, some got life, one or two got milder sentences. But uh, Jack got a life sentence. But nobody knew that, you see, until two years later. The immediate reaction was he had disappeared. Nobody knew what had happened. Uh, his mother was informed that he was presumed missing and dead horrible thing. And for two years, the Chinese communists said nothing. Uh, even in July of 54, uh, uh, when they were asked to list all the American civilians uh, China was holding, they didn't mention him. So nothing was known. And uh, then suddenly, November 23rd, of 1954, there was an announcement, a big deal. The announcement was that uh, together with 11 American Air Force uh, officers, uh, who had also three weeks or maybe six weeks later had been shot down over China, that Downey and Fecto had been brought before the Supreme People's Court's military tribunal uh, and uh, they were punished for being spies, espionage. They were also, I would have thought, involved in at least potential sabotage through what they had organized. But this made a stunning impact, of course. Uh, many people uh, were shocked, and uh, it really was uh, a big bump in U.S.-China relations. It wasn't the only one, uh, to be sure. The U.S. had to do something about this. Uh, we had to explain it. China was producing all kinds of evidence through the new China news agency, photographs of equipment, etc., and they were said to have the two defendants to have confessed. Uh, and uh, the U.S. government put out a totally preposterous story, that they were civilian employees of the Army, that they were on a flight between Seoul and Tokyo, and somehow they were shot down by these godless communists uh, in China. One story purported to say the plane had been blown off its course by a big storm, etc. The Chinese media ridiculed the American story, but the U.S. media and didn't seem too disturbed by it. Uh, and uh, that's what passed for the truth for a long time in U.S.-China relations. The U.S. continued to hold to this preposterous uh, story. Uh, Of course, by then, July 53, we had already had the armistice in Korea. That provided for the return of prisoners of war on each side. And uh, the U.S. began an effort uh, to say that uh, Downey and Fecto should be treated like the 11 airmen who had been captured in uniform. The Chinese said they, too, had been spies. And uh, the UN was asked by the United States to try to extract the 13 of them, the 11 airmen and the two civilians, Downey and Fecto, from Chinese prison uh, under their awning of prisoners of war from uh, Korean War leftovers. The UN wouldn't buy the story with uh, Downey and Fecto. Uh, they were able to say that the 11 airmen came under the rubric of uh, military personnel who were prisoners of war, uh, but uh, Dag Hammarskjöld, who went to Beijing in order to help free those people after a general assembly resolution, 
uh, wasn't able to get Downey and Fecto out. Uh, the U.S. tried through discussions, especially 55, 56, uh, with the Chinese to extract Downey and Fecto as well as others who were held. A number of Americans who had been convicted of being counter-revolutionaries, just as Downey and Fecto had, did win their release in 55. Two friends of mine, Alan and Adele Rickett of the University of Pennsylvania, for example, whom I didn't know, uh, they had spent four, four and a half years, respectively, in Chinese prison as counter-revolutionaries, but they came out in 55. There were a couple reported suicides of Americans who had uh, uh, been detained for long periods. But Downey and Fecto were maybe the most prominent of those uh, who were uh, remaining. Uh, Mrs. Downey, of course, was very relieved to know her son was alive. Uh, and uh, China agreed to uh, allow her to visit it looked like the U.S. government had encouraged her at first to believe they would permit her to visit. Uh, but then, uh, apparently, Secretary Dulles, who was determined to try to get things from China without making any concessions, uh, trying to uphold the relationship with Chiang Kai-shek, trying to avoid any admission of the truth that might embarrass the United States in the constant propaganda war uh, with the People's Republic. Uh, Dulles uh, denied her a passport uh, that was good for travel to China. And to give you some of the flavor <clears throat> of that, I have a letter that Dulles sent to Mrs. Downey, and it's just it reeks with hypo uh, hypocrisy uh, and, uh, of course, untrue accusations. He says he expresses his deep personal sympathy and the concern of your government in the cruel dilemma which the Chinese communists have forced upon you through the continued illegal imprisonment of your son. Public opinion throughout the free world will judge the words and deeds of those who have it within their power to end promptly the tragic grief which they have visited upon you. Only they can uh, demonstrate concern for the human suffering they have caused. The increasingly belligerent attitude and actions of the Chinese communists uh, have forced this government to the reluctant conclusion it would be imprudent for the time being to issue passports valid for travel to communist China to any American citizens. In the interest of peace, we do not think it prudent to afford the Chinese communists further opportunities to provoke our nation and strain its patience further. Now, this is just a reversal of the truth. What it was is we had illegally attacked them. The United States not only refused, as Nancy's work showed and the reasons for it, to establish diplomatic relations after recognizing the communist regime, but we did everything possible secretly to undermine it, blatant violation of public international law. And yet, the pretense was these were innocent American sons of American mothers who grew up eating apple pie and ice cream, and these godless communists had taken uh, unfair advantage and held them unreasonably without any foundation as hostages. This, we claimed, was hostage diplomacy. And so any American who went to China after that would be at risk of being kidnapped detained, etc. I think, parenthetically, the biggest evil we confront today in dealing with China is arbitrary detention. Tomorrow at the Council on Foreign Relations here in Washington, I'm running a seminar 
on reviewing all the ways that the PRC in recent years have developed arbitrary detention. But the Downey Fecto case cannot be categorized by any means as arbitrary detention. Just think if people came into Washington and tried to do what they were trying to do, what would we do to them? It's just an amazing hypocritical story. And uh, Dulles went to his grave in 58. He was a prominent, uh, I should be very careful, Presbyterian uh, layman. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he felt very self-righteous. He was also the head of our most prominent law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell. And his brother Allen, of course, by that time, was the uh, head of the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, what I've been reading over recent days has led me to believe that there was some disagreement among the relevant agencies in Washington about how far we should go in trying to extract Downey and Fecto. It looks like the agency tried harder to persuade the State Department and Defense Departments uh, to go to bat and get these fellows out. And the agency, of course, had reason to feel guilty. I mean, the involvement of Downey and Fecto on the night of November 29th, 1952, that was amateur hour at its worst. They really didn't know what they were doing. It was a half-assed kind of arrangement. The agency later uh, agreed that there were operational mistakes uh, made, and uh, the fellow who'd been their boss, I don't know that he ever suffered any sanction, but uh, in retrospect, the agency made it clear uh, he should have been held to account. So this was the situation in the mid-50s when China, coming out of the post-Korean War situation, went to a period of both domestic and international, uh, you might say, a relaxation. Uh, and uh, 1955, 56, 57, China was reaching out, trying to tempt us away from Chiang Kai-shek uh, in, into some response. One of the most interesting um, efforts was uh, they were willing to allow the 40 American news organizations that had applied for permission to visit China uh, to come to China. And uh, if the U.S. would agree, they made it clear they would uh, release Downey and Fecto. From a later perspective, that sounds like a fabulous deal. We get our news agencies into China. We begin to learn about what's been happening there from 1949 to 1956 or so, and we get some of our prisoners out. But somehow that never came about. I think Downey, we later learn, expected to get out at that time. When I asked him once, why didn't you study Chinese? Why were you still going on with Russian, uh, even in the cell? He said, I, I thought we were going to get out soon. And that was in the mid-50s. Dulles rejected that possibility. He said to allow our media to go to China would be trafficking with evil. It would be yielding to moral blackmail. Again, there's the assumption that these people in China were practicing hostage uh, diplomacy, and we couldn't allow ourselves, understandably, to be jerked around like that. Well, we missed the opportunity. Chinese policy then went on a very radical course. Beginning 57, 58, you had the so-called anti-rightist movement to suppress rightist thinking. Uh, you had the break with the Soviet model of government they had imported. Uh, you had 58, 59, 60, the disastrous Great Leap Forward. And of course, this culminated beginning 66 uh, in the worst days of the Cultural Revolution. So Jack and Fecto just stayed put. There were very little chance of getting them out. 
In the meantime, we had our class 15th reunion in 1966. I'm not much of a reunion type. I miss the fifth and the 10th, but I got a lot of pressure from some of our classmates. You have to come at least on Friday night for a dinner because we're gonna discuss a big effort to get Jack Downey out. So I did go and I tried to resist when they made me wear a super class Superman costume, which was the theme of our reunion. But despite that, we had a serious talk and I ended up getting uh, assigned the task of trying to get Jack out. And for the next seven years, I spent quite a bit of time <clears throat> in that effort. In the beginning, since the Cultural Revolution was just breaking out, uh, the beginning April, to July of 1966, it was hardly uh, a good time. Uh, on the other hand, it was also ironically a time, as some of you know, in Washington, there was a beginning of a sense of we need a new China policy. And I remember visiting the State Department shortly after Senator Fulbright had had some hearings, I think, in 66. Uh, and uh, we were told by the State Department that this showed maybe the American people were getting ready for a new policy. But the State Department and, uh, of course, uh, the Democratic administration uh, was not prepared uh, to do anything at that point. They were still under enormous Republican pressure uh, not to move toward uh, red China. So, 67, we had the Nixon Foreign Affairs article where he dropped a couple of sentences about we can't keep China out of the world community. And when the worst days of the Cultural Revolution uh, began to moderate by the summer fall of 69, uh, we began to see U.S.-China relations were starting to thaw, and there were some chance I felt for getting Downey out as well as for a broader reconciliation between uh, China and the United States. But still, not much was happening. Uh, I began to get a little impatient. In October 1970, uh, the PRC in Canada established diplomatic relations. Huang Hua, a very able diplomat, became the first Chinese ambassador uh, to Canada. And since the Chinese were not permitted to come here and we weren't permitted to go to China, Canada became a meeting place for some of us who were studying US-China relations. And uh, I started to go up there fairly regularly as did some others. Indeed, we had a kind of an informal contest. Who could spend the longest time meeting with Huang Hua? And, you know, we'd come back and say, I had three hours with Huang Hua last Tuesday. And I would say, oh, I had three and a half a week ago, et cetera. And we discovered the art to long talks with Huang Hua was not to drink anything. <laughs> because if you had to use the facilities, Huang Hua, who was very polite until then, would take the occasion to show you to the door. So uh, on one of those occasions, I got the idea, why not raise the Downey case with him? And from my work on international law in China, I felt it was the lying of the US, the hypocrisy that really alienated the PRC. And I said to Huang Hua, if we can get the American government to tell the truth about this case, would your government consider releasing Downey and Fecto? And he said, well, that sounds like an interesting idea. I'll send it back to Beijing. Well, I never knew, of course, what then happened uh, to the idea. Uh, I, Henry Kissinger, with whom I'd had some contacts uh, beginning uh, the, with the Nixon administration because of a Harvard MIT group that had made some proposals, including the secret trip that he ended up going on. Uh, Henry always kept the secret. He never told me if th this was being discussed uh, or not. Finally, in June of 71, Senator Fulbright had another set of hearings. 
I was asked to testify. It was national television. I remember Barbara Tuchman uh, was also uh, on that uh, in that session, and I thought, well, this is an occasion that has to be grasped. Uh, and I told the truth, just I've told you this story uh, to uh, uh, Fulbright. And I remember him leaning down from his position, and he said, do you mean to tell me our government has been lying about this case since 1954? And I had to say, yes, exactly. And uh, shortly afterward, we'd had our 20th college reunion. I went to that. And I published an op-ed after that in the New York Times, which was well displayed. And the title was, Will Jack Make His 25th Reunion? So pressure was building up. But still, the US government wouldn't come out and say what I hoped would be the magic words. Well, we had the Vietnam War going badly presidential re-election for Nixon was coming up. George McGovern was the Democratic uh, opponent. I liked George McGovern. He was an attractive American war hero, very smart and a good guy. And the key question was treatment of prisoners of war by Vietnam, and could we get the Americans released who were held as prisoners in Vietnam? McGovern was not the smartest candidate, and he was facing a very difficult campaign. It was clear Nixon was a huge favorite. It was also clear the Chinese wanted Nixon to win. They regarded Nixon as a reliable partner against the Soviet Union, and McGovern had said, among other things, that if he got elected, he would reduce the defense budget by one-third. And I remember when I was in China in May, June of 72, uh, uh, I was asked by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at a seminar about this size, uh, was it true that McGovern was going to uh, uh, do this to the defense budget? But while I was uh, in China, McGovern said something about the prisoners of war uh, in Vietnam that I thought was dumb. He said, I'll crawl to Hanoi on my knees if that will get our prisoners of war out. Well, who wants an American president who says he's going to crawl to Hanoi on his knees? But that illustrated the problem. I was trying to get the U.S. government to admit the truth in a, about an embarrassing situation in order to get Downey out and how to do it. Well, you know, I never liked Nixon for his domestic political misbehavior, et cetera, long before Watergate. And uh, I wasn't a friend of Henry Kissinger, although we saw each other and I admired the way he was moving uh, toward China. But on January 31st, 1973, the U.S. decided it had enough in Vietnam. It was withdrawing. And then everybody was excited. What would this mean about our prisoners of war in Vietnam? And Nixon had a big, long press conference. And in the middle of the press conference, a hand goes up, and this reporter says, does this mean the release of Jack Downey? Fecto had just been released at the end of 71 because his 20-year term was near completion. But Jack had only got a diminution, a reduction of his life sentence for another five years. So in the middle of this press conference concerned with Vietnam and Vietnamese, uh, Americans held in Vietnamese prison, comes this irrelevant question, does this mean the release of Jack Downey? And Nixon, a good lawyer, could have said, that's a perfectly irrelevant question, and dismissed it, and gone on to, back to Vietnam. But instead he said briefly, no, that's a different case. That case involved the CIA. Well, very few people, I think, outside of those with a special interest noticed what had happened. But six weeks later, Jack Downey was out. Now, of course, that was hastened because he got out March 13th of 73. I think about four or five days earlier, uh, the Nixon had asked 
uh, the Chinese to consider the fact that Downey's mother was seriously ill. And that was the final push, I think, that got him out. And Jack came to the Hong Kong border. Uh, and, uh, of course, all the reporters, I think there were dozens and dozens of reporters to greet him. And they said, are you going to write a book? And he said, what would it have? 400 empty pages. He didn't realize until later that his experience had some real value, even though it was all confinement, uh, prison experience. But you see, to the credit of Nixon and Kissinger, they handled this in a smooth way. No crawling to Beijing. They finally told the truth after almost 20 years of lying about the case, and Jack came out. Well, I could uh, call an end to this, but the human aspect is worth a few more minutes of time before we get to comments and questions. Uh, Jack came out and decided to go from one form of thought reform, Chinese, to another, American law school. <laughs> and uh, he applied to Yale Law School. His father had gone to Yale Law School. His father was a well-known New Britain, Connecticut lawyer. And Jack wanted to do that. That was his original idea before he got recruited by the CIA. And uh, the shocking thing to many of my classmates was the Yale Law School turned him down. I'm a Yale Law School graduate. I wasn't following Jack's case. I was teaching at Harvard Law School then. But I got a phone call from one of our classmates, Tony Schulte, uh, who was very close to uh, Jack. And he was just angry as can be. And he told me they went in to question the Yale Law School admissions officer. And he said, look, his record was good, but not outstanding. His LSAT score was just so-so. And what's he been doing for the last 20 years? <laughs> Just a, an incredible decision. They talk about how to offend the alumni. Well, Tony called me up and he told me this story. I said, I'll call you back this afternoon. I went down to the dean's office and saw our then Dean Russell Simpson. I told him this story. He said, tell him to apply. We'll admit him. And he did. And uh, Jack, uh, when I talked to him about it, he said, what do I have to do? I said, I just want you once a year to meet with the rest of our students and tell us about your experience in China. He said, OK, but I don't want to do it in the classroom. So my wife, Joan, who's here, and I, every once every year for the three years he was there, 73 to 76, uh, we would have all the students over to our house and we'd have a really interesting evening because Jack would talk about what was happening at different phases in China, all the mass movements and campaigns, etc. And I would talk about what was going on on the outside and our efforts uh, to, uh, to get him out. So this was, uh, and to make it even better, in the summer before going to law school, Jack decided to renew his Russian and go to Yale Summer School. And uh, there, while he was there, he met uh, his wife-to-be, a Chinese woman from the same area in uh, China, northeast China, near Shenyang, where uh, he'd been shot down. She was working as a technician in the Yale Chemistry Department. And before long, they got married. And, uh, eventually produced uh, a child. This was a, an amazing story. Jack wanted to get uh, into politics. He made two attempts, but didn't get very far in the Democratic primaries, but did establish enough of a record and connections. He became a judge. Now there's a courthouse named after him uh, in New Haven. He died uh, a while back. But he left a memoir. And that memoir, I hope, uh, will soon be published. It's a very exciting read, going into all kinds of detail about what was happening. 
This is a human case. It's a case full of meaning. But let's just talk for a minute about what does it mean for today beyond the personal interest. And uh, uh, you see, the People's Republic was just entering the world community in 1949. They were just beginning to try to use public international law. And this was the kind of exposure that they were given by the United States, the then not only principal power in the world, but also the leading exponent of public international law. And that kind of exposure, that kind of introduction, uh, couldn't be lost on the PRC. Not only had they been excluded from the UN, uh, even before they entered uh, the uh, uh, Korean conflict, uh, but uh, they also see how the rules of the game were practiced. The US obviously manipulated uh, the UN, even in the Korean War when the Soviets came back and started to veto things in the Security Council. We developed this imaginative uniting for peace resolution that allowed us, uh, allowed us through the General Assembly when the Security Council couldn't act uh, to continue our co uh, combat against uh, North Korea and China. So this cynical secret uh, attacks in an attempt to upset the new government in China, which many people in the U.S. and Washington and our agencies thought might be very insecure. They might not last. Maybe we could act through various secretive efforts to uh, destabilize them. And of course, we moved uh, secretly in Tibet and other places. The Downey excursion was only one part of an overall plan. But this was the origin of uh, Beijing's exposure to public international law. Uh, and I don't think uh, we can uh, overlook uh, the fact. Another thing that troubles me out of this is the gullibility of most of our media. Most of our media simply talk handouts from the White House, the State Department, and the Defense Department than others, not really challenging even this preposterous story about the plane that got shot down en route to Tokyo, et cetera. Uh, I felt that there have been a few attempts to expose some of the secrecy and uh, behind the scenes efforts of our government, including one by one of our classmates, Tom Ross, who was an able reporter, was a co-author of a study of the uh, CIA practices. Uh, but the fact is uh, that uh, we have taken and we're often the victims of handouts that should be further questioned. Investigative reporting has come a long way since the 50s, but I still think we have to be aware of that. And we should understand, even when we look at the Taiwan question, the PRC going back to the so-called century of humiliation that preceded it, has always had an intense emphasis on sovereignty, territorial integrity, uh, not having foreigners influence uh, their government and polity, et cetera. And you can see with the history of these secret attacks on China uh, that started and what Jack Downey was an organizer of, uh, how that continued. The five principles of peaceful coexistence uh, came out in the mid-50s, just at the time that China was experiencing this. So I think this experience has some contemporary relevance. Uh, we're engaged today in a whole range of efforts to improve our relationship with China. And some of it is, is very secret, what they're doing to us gets occasionally reported in the press. What we're doing to them is seldom as well reported. And yet we have to create better rules of the game. We have to agree on a better understanding of the theory and practice of international law. And whether we talk about uh, uh, law of the sea or we talk about uh, 
uh, the uh, questions of the outer space or cyberspace. Many attempts are being uh, pursued now in varying degrees. Uh, and we have to see, can we somehow inspire confidence in each other? And people always say trust, we need trust, but the question is uh, how to do it. But I think when you look back on this uh, sad chapter of the start of USPRC diplomacy, there are some lessons in it uh, for today. Well, uh, I'd like to hear from you. We have a lot of expertise in this audience, and uh, it would be good. I eventually, I'll write this up, but uh, I better hear some good comments before that rather than afterward. <laughs> Questions or comments? Yes, right, right here. There's a, there's a microphone. Oh, here's a mic. Great. Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, I'm Jim, Jim Mann at Johns Hopkins SICE. Um, these are detailed questions, but first of all, Jim Lilly, I vaguely remember him talking about the case, or maybe he wrote about it in his memoir. Was he a classmate? Was he involved yes. in these efforts? Uh, Jim Lilly uh, was our... He came to our reunions. Uh, by the last reunions we had, he and I would be the speakers because our class had developed an intense interest in China. I think Jim was technically class of 1950 F, which meant he graduated in January 51. But he and I were both in Sabre College, and I knew Jim better than I knew Jack. I liked Jim a lot. Um. If I can, one other, you spoke about the press. Um, that question that came up in the middle, out of nowhere, uh, what about, does this mean the release of Jack Downey out of the blue in a press conference about Vietnam? Do you think that was prompted? And I... I <laughs> I'd be amazed if it wasn't. <laughs> I mean, I, I asked that because... On, the fame, on Nixon's trip to China, there's a point at the end of the, as Nixon's about to go home, when they feel they've left some questions open about Vietnam, I mean, excuse me, about Taiwan, and Kissinger asks a friendly reporter, would you ask this, uh, and then proceeds to explain in a way that will get him out of get him out and away from the tough questions that might be asked by someone else who was actually Stanley Carno. But they, they, were, they were good at prompting. There's a lot to this record that yeah. I don't yet have access to. I don't know. I'm sure there are people Thanks. in this room who may know more about it than I. Uh, I remember when I first went to China in May of 72, uh, I tried in meetings with my hosts, which are really the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, to make the case for not only getting Jack out, but I actually tried to see him. But uh, May of 72 was considered uh, too early at that time. So there, are, I'd love to hear from any of you, even as they say, offline, uh, if you can provide any uh, information about the final details. I don't, I've never asked Henry uh, about it. I probably should. Thank you. Jamie. Yes. Yeah, the State Department, CIA, maybe you can get some details that way. Good. Jamie Horsley is a specialist on freedom of information in China and the United States. Good idea. I, I think you, you missed one detail in your, in your remarks. Pardon? You missed one detail in your remarks that I wanted to ask you. Only about. one? That I, that I, that I could, that, oh. that occurred to me. Your uh, op-ed in the New York Times was, will Jack make his 25th reunion? Yes. Did he actually go to his 25th reunion? Oh, I think so. I should tell you. Oh, yes, thank you for that. Reminds me because <laughs> over time, the CIA decided to turn a vice into a virtue and to go public. And in 2006, uh, they published uh, an important uh, interview, 
it was in a, a magazine you probably are familiar with that I didn't know about, uh, but it, uh, yeah, uh, in the Journal of the American Intelligence Profession, mm, yeah. an article was published in 2006 called Extraordinary Fidelity. And it's the account of two CIA prisoners in China, 1952 to 73. And this was the account in which they admitted operational mistakes had been made. Just a cavalier lack of concern for lives that were being played with, etc. cetera. And uh, that very long article uh, resulted in 2011 in a film a kind of uh, documentary with actors that portrayed Downey and Fecto in prison and that was shown at our reunion in 2011. So that would have been our 60th yeah. reunion. And Jack was there then, of course. So um, we still don't know. And Jack himself, of course, didn't know all the efforts being made by different people, agencies, et cetera, uh, in attempt to uh, help them get out. Thank you, it's Bert Keidel. I teach at uh, George Washington University now. Jerry, it's great to see you after a long time. Uh, I, I wanted to just go from your comment about the press that they were gullible uh, and and develop that a second. It seems to me that when I talk to the press about China, there's an issue of access to the government, uh, which is at risk uh, if they start saying things that don't really match uh, what the public talking points are. And I wanted to shift from that towards Xinjiang and uh, ask what does in public international law say about the policies that a country can legally undertake when it finds a region seeking independence with the help of an outside power. Uh, where does that stand and how does the information we're getting about Xinjiang, uh, and particularly if it fits into sort of the weaponization of human rights, how does that fit into the span of, you're talking about this, this now 60 year history of uh, first really lying and then finding out what that did to our relations with the Chinese? Yeah, uh, of course, that's why we're having this meeting tomorrow at the council to talk about all the forms of detention. And Xinjiang has enlightened the world about hundreds of thousands of people are being arbitrarily held under various excuses that China has now had to be prodded into claiming uh, and have no legal basis whatever domestically not to mention internationally. Of course, it's a scandal internationally what's happening in terms of, I, you could certainly make a case of crimes against humanity, etc. This raises the whole question that's so debated about uh, the right of foreign governments to intervene for purposes of humanity because of uh, terrible human rights abuses by another country, and of course, nothing makes China more afraid than that. And of course, we have to fear it too because it could become a vehicle for getting out of hand and leading to armed conflict. This, these are all very complicated questions. It's funny what you said also made me think of another point I left out of, I have in my notes. I, it's interesting, again, uh, not a, a sort of collateral. Uh, on the day of the Fulbright hearings in June of 71, after the hearing, I went over to the State Department to talk to the desk officer about the Downey case and to try to push for more vigorous efforts to get him out. Uh, the desk officer was a very nice fellow named Bill Brown, and we talked for about an hour. And when I... Uh, he, he knew I had had breakfast that morning with Kissinger at the White House. And I get to the door to say goodbye. We hadn't been talking about China policy, only the case, Downey case. But Bill said just one more thing. He said, 
Henry didn't happen to say anything about what our China policy is, did he? <laughs> now here's this guy. He's the desk officer on China. I'm an itinerant occasional person in coming to Washington, and he's asking me whether Henry had told me what our China, because he certainly wasn't telling the State Department uh, at that point. Really, this is great. <laughs> There's a question in the back there. Thank you. My name is Jean Ng Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Professor Cohen, I wish to thank you for your instrumental work with the PCA that we eventually had the PCA verdict about the South China Sea based on the UNCLOS in 19, I mean 2017, 2016. Um, would you advise us what to do now with the <laughs> PCA verdict to sustain the international law, which is very important at this point in time? You're getting on one of my other favorite subjects, <laughs> but I, I, I can't invoke the rule of relevance here, but I don't see exactly how we're going to connect this with the Jack Downey case. But I do feel that the Philippine arbitration case that was so decisively uh, in favor of the Philippines uh, is worthy of much more support. Uh, than it's received, even from the government of Vietnam. And I sympathize with the position of the government of Vietnam on some of these uh, questions. But I think we should save that for another Wilson Center discussion about the law of the sea. I think we have time for, for one more question. I see people are putting on coats because it's getting cold in here. So I have one more question, and then we'll move to our reception. Uh, Jerry, you, you uh, talked about the history, and it seems to me that there are, are opportunities that were missed uh, along the way, not necessarily always the fault of the United States. And one period that I know that you were very uh, involved in many efforts was around 1966, when, among other things, there was founded both the U.S.-China People's uh, Friendship Associations that, you know, first of all, sent scholars to China through the Committee on Scholarly Communication with China, and the... Uh, the organization still exists today that's, you know, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, which did the people-to-people -people thing, the first ping-pong visit in that. Uh, but it seemed that by, by 66, China wasn't receptive anymore, and, you know, it was going to the Cultural Revolution. And so things that might have happened, uh, you know, I, when I briefly was in charge of the, uh, the Committee on Scholarly Communication, I came across a, a letter that was written to Robert Lumiansky, who was president of the American Council of Learned Societies that was one of the founders of the Committee on Scholarly Communication. And they had written the Chinese government in 65 to see if Holmes Welch, a scholar of Taoism at Harvard, might be able to have a, a, a conference about Taoism with Chinese colleagues, either in the United States or in China. And he got a response from the, uh, the Revolutionary Guard Committee at the Chinese Academy of Sciences that said that, um, Taoism and all the other feudal religions of China were big stinking weeds, and that if they tried to bring this back to China, they would certainly smash his dog head. <laughs> and that didn't seem to be a very welcoming response to that overture. No, that's what I said. It was ironic at the time when the U.S., through the National Committee's organization and other efforts, was beginning, uh, you know, uh, to, muster some at least academic, you might say, egghead support uh, that China went into the Cultural Revolution. And that delayed us three years uh, at least. Uh, very, very uh, uh, unfortunate. There's so many ironies of history here. But your mention of Holmes Welch deserves a footnote. I often now cite him. Holmes was the most delicate, full-time scholar at Harvard, a genuine academic person. But he wrote an article in the Atlantic magazine that I've always thought was very profound. It was called The Chinese Art of Make-Believe. And the theme was how many times in Chinese history Chinese have managed through fiction 
innovation, uh, imaginative efforts to overcome problems. And I always invoke that when we come to talk about Taiwan mainland relations. Because what we've seen, after all, Beijing used to say, we will never negotiate with Taiwan, a mere province of China, on an equal basis. And yet, certainly under the eight years of the Ma Ying-jeou regime, you had both sides willingly resort to a, 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 a essentially a fictional kind of organizations, you might call them white glove organizations, as you know, to make over 20 agreements. And those agreements, some of them even now, have lasting consequence, although Beijing refuses to implement others. But it's, that made me often think about, it's the old story about Teddy White and the dinner in Chongqing, when Zhou Enlai was giving a dinner, and out came the piece de resistance, a suckling pig. And Teddy White said, I'm Jewish, I don't eat pig. And Zhou Enlai reportedly said, take another look, that's no pig. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm glad you mentioned Holmes Welch. I'm, I'm gonna be using that in the, in the future. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Professor Cohen, this is fascinating stories, fascinating uh, lessons for us. Um, there's going to be a reception um, in the room across the hallway from here, uh, so please uh, join us there. But before we break, uh, please join me in uh, thanking Professor Cohen. <laughs>